Good evening and welcome to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Tonight we have two fascinating cases on the theme of geriatrics. Discussing the first case tonight, we have our panel of experts consisting of Dr Jim McConaughey, Rural GP. Uh, we have um, coming shortly Dr Nassal Ganga, geriatrician at Toowoomba General Hospital and St Vincent's Private Hospital. Jackie Graham, a speech pathologist here in Toowoomba. Uh, and Dr Andy Mellis, Rural GP here in Toowoomba also. Please welcome our specialist and expert panellists. As usual, we're being live streamed around Australia. We have a number of participants watching remotely, so I encourage you all to join the discussion by emailing your questions to grandrounds at qrme.org.au or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag now on your screen. Our presenter tonight is Dr Joanne Pappas from Clifton Medical Centre and she will be presenting a case on dysphagia. Please put your hands together for Joanne. Okay, so I've got the case tonight on dysphagia. It's pretty run of the mill sort of case. Um, at Clifton, we look after um, both the nursing home high, high level and low level care. So, so this is um, Mrs. DT. She's a 95 year old woman who lives in the nursing home at Clifton and she's been there since t December 2014. Um, she's actually in high care. <coughs> Uh, she was admitted to the nursing home after a fall at home where she actually suffered a fractured neck of her femur on the right side and also a distal fracture of her radius also on the right side. Prior to that, she was actually previously living independently but was uh, quite malnourished on admission to hospital and she didn't progress well enough through rehab to enable her to go home. So she was doing quite well being a 94-year-old in the community living at home. So her past history is she has uh, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, she has an aortic valve replacement, she has a pacemaker, osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. She does have some impaired cognition and she's also incontinent of both faeces and urine. Her medications are as follows, so she's on asasantin, uh, eprosartan for blood pressure, isosorbid mononitrate, metoprolol and verapamil. Her social history is uh, she has one daughter who lives at Allara, one of the small towns near Clifton, and she visits almost daily. She's also the power of attorney for Mrs DT. She's been widowed for a number of years, and as I said pri uh, previously, she was living at home alone, and she's also a DBA gold card holder. So on examination, uh, Mrs DT is a thin, frail, older woman and she spends a lot of time in bed. She was, she's alert and responsive, but she's often sleepy. She do, does have some degree of cognitive impairment, but she lacks the uh, capacity for decision making. Uh, heart sound stool, chest, uh, mild crepitations at the bases, but adequate air entry. Abdomen soft, non-tender, no masses with bowel sounds present. She's got no edema in her lower limbs. Uh, and in terms of, she's 47 kilograms at the moment, so she is quite a little old lady. Uh, so basically the investigations with her was um, a gradual progression with her <coughs> dysphagia was noted by the nurses. <coughs> basically she was taking quite a long time to get through all of her meals. Um, she was coughing after each mouthful and uh, they were monitoring her weight and uh, she was having trouble staying, um, staying with a stable weight, so was losing some weight. Uh, and we actually have a speech pathologist that comes down to the nursing home and they, um, we referred her to be reviewed there. Uh, so after her review, the um, suggestions for Mrs DT was um, that she could feed herself most of the time. She uses a thick spoon with a curved handle. She's on a V4 diet and T3 fluids and she's managing this quite okay. She drinks with a two-handled feed cup uh, with a lid. Meals are quite a lengthy process and often she needs prompting to swallow and, um, and someone is generally present when she's having that. Uh, she does take all her me medications whole, but again, it's often quite a slow process and, um, and someone's watching the whole time. 
So the follow-up for Mrs DT at the moment is we are having a regular review with speech pathology uh, every three months and um, we also, uh, myself and the other registrar, look after the nursing home patients. So um, she is reviewed regularly on our nursing home rounds. So I guess the questions from the case that I've come up with um, is how often should we be having a speech review in a nursing home patient? Uh, when would be the ideal time to review a patient living at home? Uh, what uh, can we do as a GP to advise patients regarding modifying their diet if a speech uh, review is not available? Uh, and in terms of medications, um, particularly in geriatrics, uh, if we can rationalise or get rid of some medications, where would we go with that? And lastly, um, which I think definitely working in both the low care and high care nursing home, I, you come across a lot, is um, how do you approach a patient that's not willing to comply with their recommendations regarding the dysphagia? Right. Okay. Thanks very much, Jo. No problems. All right. Well, there's some very interesting sort of questions that have sort of come out of this case. Um, I thought we might just start with a um, rural GP perspective. So either Andy or Jim, um, maybe start, start with you, Andy, if that's all right. Sort of uh, when you've got a, a patient that um, has these sorts of um, more lifestyle sort of side of um, things or social sort of issues, sort of how do you approach um, this sort of a patient? say, you know, as she was sort of moving into the nursing home from her failed rehab following her fall? With respects to her swallowing specifically? Oh, just asking? in general, your general approach towards this sort of patient and what you kind of look at. Um, Sorry, that's a very broad question. It <laughs> is. Um, I was hoping you would clarify it for me a little, Lucy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in, in regards to her speech, I think as our experience is it's, it's often led uh, by the nursing staff because they're the ones that are so directly linked um, with medication administration, meal times, feeding and the assistance in nursing. Um, so my experience with that is that they would be the ones that are guiding us on uh, realising that there's an issue um, and asking if they can get approval to seek speech therapy review. So. Um, my experience of my role as the GP in that is it's very much a case of uh, being available to the staff who are actually dealing with the patient hands-on um, and being acceptant of the fact that they're in the best position to, uh, to gauge that and if they feel that there's an issue they're detecting then absolutely we would seek speech therapy review on that. Um, I'm certainly not going to uh, pretend that I'm in the best place to make that judgement uh, on those sorts of issues. Um, so uh, that's how I would approach that particular issue in that area. Um, do you have any other particular facets of the case you were looking to draw out, Lucy? Um, I wonder about um, this lady living at home beforehand and um, after her fall and, and trauma, unable to return home. Um, you know, were there things maybe leading up? to that presentation that um, as a GP we might have sort of alerted to. Do, do we think that the dysphagia is a new problem or do you think that's something that maybe wasn't recognised by her daughter caring for her at home? Or? I guess that's, that's the unknown in the equation, isn't it? You would, mm. You'd really need to know your, your background knowledge of that patient and how often you saw her when she was living independently. Um, was she presenting with risk factors in terms of recurring infections or Mm. Um, uh, to try and gauge that. Uh, if, if she was quite independent and uh, didn't have too much contact at home, then yes, she may have been blissfully unaware. Mm. And Jim, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I think as a GP, I'd, I'd be looking, other than at the dysphagia, I would be looking, she's a, you say she's incompetent to make decisions and her daughter's got power of attorney. I assume that means she's got an advanced health directive or she's she just power of attorney for legal matters or health matters. Um, mm. I'd clarify that uh, before we try, hopefully before we get her into the hospital, nursing home or soon after. Um, I would assume that uh, post-operatively or operatively when she had a neck, neck of femur done and all that sort of stuff, the, the anaesthetist is looking down her throat 
uh, if this dysphagia is a new thing or an old thing, did he see anything? Um, that would be one way of trying to find out what's going on there. Um, <coughs> I'd be asking for the discharge summary from whichever hospital she had that surgery in. As to, did they try and did she have the, the base, basal crackles at that time? Did they look at that? Did she have chest X-rays? What's her renal function uh, before she's all coming to me? There are there are quite a few unknowns in in this that you mm. need to look at. And then, assuming the daughter does have power of attorney and uh, and the lady's made an advanced health directive, um, things like dysphagia, how far are people prepared to go? Uh, mm. I mean, um, before we talk to the speech therapist or pathologist, it would be nice to know whether this lady said she refuses gastrotomy tubes, refuses anything else, all those sorts of things. You know, what are the limits of where we're aiming with this lady? Um, did the physios try and get her mobile and they've given up and said that's not going to happen? She's a bedridden lady for the rest of her life. And at 95, that, that's not likely to be long. Um, so mm -hmm. I just want to know some limitations on what I can aim for, what I can and can't do with her. Mm. Mm, right. mm. And if we come to the first question, um, how often should we have speech review in a nursing home patient? What do you think, Jim? I would defer to a speech pathologist <laughs> on that. <laughs> Let's ask uh, Jackie, okay. our speech pathologist. Uh, well, that's a fairly broad question and it is very mm. dependent on, on each case. Um, I'm one of the speech pathologists that go out to Clifton and we originally would go out once a year and that has now changed and we are out there every three months as it said in the presentation but for the residents out there some may be seen every three months, some every six months and some once a year depending <coughs> on the severity of their dysphagia and the likely change that we might see within within a time period and yeah, that would be how it would be how we would um, plan our, our reviews. What do you think about um, a check on admission? I think that's a very good idea. Uh, dysphagia is a very common issue that we see in the ageing population and having a review, <coughs> excuse me, having a review on admission gives us a baseline uh, and it gives us an idea of a diet and fluid uh, recommendation to put in place for any patient and um, they may not need any changes and they may need a change, it, it would depend on the patient, but it gives you a baseline so they're safe within that environment. Right. Um, and when would be the ideal time to review a patient living at home? At home, well ideally you'd want to review uh, at the beginning of any sort of dysphagic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, quite often that's not identified. Um, dysphagia is not a well-known issue amongst the community and it's not an issue that patients will bring up with their GP. They don't see it as a medical problem that they find it difficult to chew, that they find it difficult to swallow fluids and when their GP may ask, do you have any other problems you want to talk about, they won't bring that up because they don't mm. see it as something the GP can help them with. Uh, so it is quite difficult to see someone at home at the initiation of a dysphagic issue, um, but ideally you'd want to see them at that time, but quite often it is mm. um, a fair way down the line when they have become malnourished, when they are aspirating, when they're in hospital with a pneumonia. Mm. And unfortunately that is the time that you do see those people. What would you suggest then for GPs and GP registrars to try and bring this onto the agenda? Mm. Mm. Uh, it is something that we have tried to address in our practice. Um, we've developed a list of questions that we've provided to a fair few medical centres in Toowoomba uh, to give to their practice nurses who do some questioning for the health assessments at um, uh, each age is, is a bit different at the medical centres. I believe it's a 75 year mm. health assessment uh, and that way the practice nurse can run through some core questions and some supplementary questions if required uh, and we've developed those questions are things that we ask patients when they come in to see us to help uh, narrow down any dysphagic issues to know whether they do need a referral to speech pathology and if they are having troubles specific, specific to their swallowing. So that's something that can be put in place at a GP practice. Great, so hmm. sort of like a screening tool. Exactly, yeah, just like a screening tool. Hmm. And certainly what we do at our practice and that mm. we have a chronic disease nurse who will do mm. our over 75 health checks. Yeah, exactly. Um, and her aim is to get those done annually and so certainly I think that's the most, uh, the most convenient time to be trying to do that. Mm.
Yes, because they are in the practice at that time and they mm. are going through that whole questionnaire case history process. Absolutely, it's, and it's, it's a just, natural process. Exactly, and mm. it's something additional that we provided as speech mm. pathology specific. Yeah. yeah. Mm, great. Do you have anything further to add on that? Or? <laughs> I was just wondering if you could interpret for um, the registrars uh, watching um, the uh, discussion um, during the case of the thickened fluids and the you know the grading of the fluids. Oh, okay. mm. Right. So the grading in the presentation today is not the general grading that you'll see across Australia. Oh. Um, this is a specific grading that we use in our practice and amongst the nursing homes and hospitals that we work at. Uh, but what uh, this lady has been receiving is a texture B <coughs> minced and moist diet and uh, extremely thick fluids. So in terms of diet that would be a minced meat and mashed vegetable with plenty of sauce or gravy mixed through her main meal and almost all of her snacks and desserts would be either minced up or mashed up or pureed. Uh, for her fluids and extremely thick, uh, those are fluids that you generally need to have off a teaspoon. I know in the presentation it said she was having them from a feeder cup that's actually quite difficult for anyone to drink that level of thickness through a spout uh, so it's likely that that lady would be receiving her fluids off a teaspoon and it would be much safer for her as well instead of sucking sucking fluids from a spout or having her hyper extended and opening her airway while she was drinking mm. so okay. that would be the fluids and diet that she's receiving right now mm. Um, and how, how do you assess which level of thickness is required, if I can dig into the art of speech <laughs> therapy? <laughs> okay, well we, uh, we look at a fair few uh, factors. Um, mm. The primary one would be, are they aspirating on a specific level of thickness? And that's the first thing that we look at. So we do a clinical trial, um, mm. trialling various thicknesses of fluids. But we also need to look at how easily positioned is that person? Uh, what's their alertness like? Do they fatigue throughout the day? Do they fatigue throughout a meal? How easily can they be fed? How cooperative are they? All of those different mm. factors which can increase their risk of aspiration throughout a meal. This particular lady or any other patient might be able to swallow a mildly thick fluid, but they might not be able to sit up correctly. So they're mm they're not in a good posture to swallow. They might be very confused and talking while they're eating and drinking. It's another risk factor. Perhaps they've got a respiratory condition and they are coughing or are short of breath while e whilst eating. So that's something else that we consider in placing someone on a diet. And sometimes that's why speech pathology recommendations can seem over cautious, uh, but we are trying to consider all of those factors so that what that patient is receiving is safe for them at the time of the meal, uh, at lunch, at breakfast, lunch and dinner, but it's safe in between meals and throughout the night if they're getting up to have a drink or to eat something. Mm. Um, and uh, if we can sort of skip down to kind of medications, because um, I think that's sort of tied in in this case. You know, this lady, she's 94 and she was on four, maybe five medications. That's pretty good, really. What do you guys think? <laughs> can, can we de-prescribe in this woman? I would, um, certainly if swallowing's the issue, you would try and manage her with medication that's either dissolvable or take uh, easier to take. Uh, mm -hmm. She, I think, she was on a uh, a nice sorbide dural. I would mm -hmm. replace that with a patch. Uh, she's on both verapamil and uh, a beta blocker. Does she need either, or is certainly not a good combination of drug? Uh, um, but I'm sure people have tried to use alternatives in the past, <coughs> but uh, they're not recommended together. Um, and does she need them? Um, it's difficult to stop drugs, but uh, yeah, I would certainly consider that. Um, uh, and if they're for rate control rather than, uh, than uh, hypertension, you might look at uh, is there an easier way to give those medications or an alternative such as uh, I think you can get digoxin in a liquid form. Um, does she need uh, the azacantin at 95? Again, that's a question. Could it be causing some sort of irritation with uh, her esophagus that might be contributing to the, 
to the thing? Could could she do with aspirin alone, which is a soluble mm. medication, or nothing? Again, nothing at all. But these things uh, either. If there are more than one doctor seeing her, they could discuss that perhaps with her power of attorney uh, mm. and as to what this lady's wishes were. Yeah, That's you could make a pretty reasonable mm. argument as a 95-year-old mm. with some cognitive <coughs> impairment bed-bound in a nursing home. Mm. In reality, does she actually need any of them? Um, but as you say, it's often one thing to say, it, it's a lot harder to actually go in and stop everything and you would need that discussion with her power of attorney about the merits of uh, uh, remaining on them, but um, it would be a pretty reasonable argument to say, she, does she really need any of them? Mm. And there could be an argument that she might need more. Does she need uh, for renal function is good? Does she need some diuretics? Is this uh, basal crackles purely due to aspiration or is it due to heart failure? I mean, mm. I don't know, it's difficult. To, uh, I would end up my aim would to be to reduce. That focus from mm. longevity mm. to, you know, let's give her medication Comfort. that might impact her quality of life rather than just mm. prolong uh, that. Mm. Um, and we can come back to then what can we do if we're awaiting speech review? So, supposing, you know, for some of these um, registrars are in quite sort of rural areas, mm. speech therapy may be sort of three or six months away before yeah. able to be reviewed. Yeah. Um, yeah, what kind of interim advice can we do, or, or is there anything that GPs can do to manage a patient when mm. they're not sure? Uh, if that patient is in a facility, uh, there are general. Um, routes that are followed um, if someone is having having dysphagia or having trouble with their current diet and fluids and a speech pathology review isn't uh, in the in the near future uh, the nursing staff are quite able to change that person's diet and fluids to a safer diet so that's always making it making the fluids thicker or making the food softer and that is quite appropriate for the nursing staff to do um, and to make a judgment um, on what they feel would be safer for that person. Uh, the only way they can't go is to make the fluids thinner or to make <coughs> the food more solid. They can't go up, but they can go down and they can make those changes. Um, and you can talk to your nursing staff about those changes and what they feel is appropriate. Because as you said earlier, the nursing staff are working with them every day and they're more familiar with how they are coping with, with mm -hmm. all of their cares. So that's something that can be done very easily. And then once the speech pathologist is able to get there, they can assess if that was the right call or whether to go further or not quite so far with, um, with the changes to any diet or fluids mm. or feeding recommendations. Um, what's it like as a patient to take thickened fluids? Does it still taste as good? Is it... It varies. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether anyone has tasted thickened fluids. I certainly have. Um, and you can get the pre-thickened tubs, which you find in hospitals and in some facilities. They taste quite good. They're not bad at all. Um, but it's more the change of the consistency that's very difficult to overcome, I find. No. Um, older people tend to prefer stronger tasting flavours, so the cordials that you can get or the juices are normally quite palatable for them mm. in the pre-thickened tubs. It's when uh, you have to thicken them with a the powder that sometimes you get a little bit of resistance mm. um, because powder thickeners or there are some liquid thickeners as well do tend to change the taste a little depending on the thickener and uh, they change the colour and um, I did say they changed the taste, didn't I? Mm. Yes, change the taste and change the colour. So that's where you get a little bit more resistance because it does look different to what they're expecting. Mm. A thick and soft drink um, looks quite strange mm. because you've got that uh, carbonation which is then caught within a thickened fluid. So um, that's where you, you find a little more resistance mm. to thickened fluids. But um, it's all getting used to a change. I, I tend to explain mm. to patients it's it's just like having to wear glasses or it's just like having to walk with a walker. It's just like having to get assistance to go to the toilet or something like that. It's um, like a medication. It's something that is it's required as you get older. Mm. It's more, most likely that you will need something like that. Mm. Thank you. Um, so yes, that brings us to compliance. <laughs> How, how do we approach a, 
a patient that's mm -hmm. sort of not going to comply. So yeah. we can start with you and then maybe get the GP perspective. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking. <laughs> I spend a lot of time talking about why we're putting this change in place, why they might need that thickened fluid or that modified diet mm. um, to start off with and what the risks are of not complying with that recommendation and what the consequences could be either with the patient or with their power of attorney depending mm. on on whoever we're we're working with um, but I find that quite often you can get compliance if you work with them because these are older people who have lived a long life and know their preferences and you have to accept those and you have to include those in your recommendations. So working out what their favourite meal is or their favourite fluid flavour and trying to <coughs> present that to them in a way that will be palat palatable to them mm. in a safe manner. Um, and quite often you can, you can find a way to uh, present those diet and fluids in a way that they will accept. Unfortunately, there are also times when people won't accept that diet and that is their choice or it is their power of attorney's choice and um, a facility will go about um, their practices so that that is um, a safe environment for them. So if someone decides not to have thickened fluids or not as thick as we might recommend, then they would be perhaps fully fed. They would never be unsupervised. Um, they would always be positioned upright. They would always um, they would always remove the fluid if there was a significant aspiration uh, episode or, or something similar. So having those precautions in place of a more dangerous situation than we would like. So they're the mm. sorts of things that we have to try and work around. Andy? Andy it's been covered very well. I mean, I think <laughs> it's starting off in, as it is with so many things that we do, it's about building relationship. It's about getting to a point where the patient actually uh, trusts what you're telling, um, they're going to buy into that and um, mm. uh, because you've earned that, that right through building relationship with them to go there but ultimately um, they retain the right to choose yeah. um, and some of them no matter what you say or how hard you try or what you explain they uh, are not going to give up on what they want to do and that's no different with people with their smoking histories and all, all the rest of it. Um, and at the end of the day, that is their right. People, mm. people uh, retain the right to choose how they wish to live and, um, and uh, uh, that's, that's their prerogative. So, um, but I think it, it ultimately comes down to building relationships so that they're actually mm. going to feel like uh, you have listened, you have taken the time, you've tried and you've been genuine and uh, that mm. if you're working for them, they're more likely to come back and try <coughs> and work for you. And it sounds yeah. like it's also a, a reasonable amount of risk management as well, you know. We're trying to sort of mitigate the risks of aspiration and, mm. and pneumonias and things like that, which mm. can be life threatening. Yes, but it can also be quite difficult to talk about managing that risk because eating and drinking is such a social activity and it's something mm. that these people have done for many, many years and it's a pleasurable activity. So when that's taken away from them or they feel like it's taken away from them, that's where um, it's quite difficult to, mm. to, to manage that risk. Mm. And they may be quite happy to accept that risk and because they, they, they take value and they appreciate what they see as giving them quality mm. uh, in eating. And they say, well, I don't care about that. Yeah. That's what I want to do, and mm. and you, you, you can get in. I know it's their right to to do that, but there are nursing staff feeding these mm. people, mm. and I have had cases where you know problems do develop with aspirations, and sudden death can develop with aspiration, and and nurses can feel great guilt. Mm. Uh, so, and institutions can be at risk of if the families are uncertain, at, at mm. risk of ignoring recommendations so there is a risk in letting them ignore what's uh, you know what's been medically recommended for them mm -hmm. I agree with you it's their right but we have to then involve the staff as well in that discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. welcome Sal. yeah hello <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have an opportunity to see the case beforehand uh, I had limited opportunity <laughs> but I can I gather what you're talking about it is, is about a patient in a Nursing home setting is, is that's, right, That's yeah. correct, yeah, with dysphagia. Yeah. Um, and no. uh, on significantly thickened fluids and pureed wet diet. Mm. Yeah, so 
from my stroke hat on and we get uh, quite a lot of patients going into nursing homes mm. with, uh, with these modified mm. diet regimes. Yes. And, uh, the, uh, and again, seeing uh, these patients every day in my, in my unit, the first thing they come, when I go to them, they ask me is, Doctor, can I have my cup of tea today? Mm. And uh, so then I, I turn to my speech pathologist and, and I always go by their recommendations and I go back and say, look, it's, it's unsafe for you to have this much of uh, these uh, normal diet and I'll give you that as soon as possible, but not now. But again, comes into in geriatric medicine most of us, most of the things what we do is all about quality of life. Mm. Now, <coughs> in a situation where I feel that we are coming to a more palliative state as such, mm. and aspiration pneumonia doesn't, it doesn't become a priority at that point of time, that's a discussion, communication is so important. Mm. And I think I get my speech pathologist's opinion and that's, I value that very much. But with that, at the time we decide on a palliation, then discuss the family regarding what is the best for the person. I always ask if your mom was here, able to speak to us. If mm. the person is uh, aphasic, what would she want? And she would say, she would want to have a cup of tea today and die tomorrow. Mm. And if that was the case, it's reasonable to suggest well, if that was the case, mm. we'll take that risk. Mm. But unless we make that very clearly regarding the palliation for a person who wants to live, it's a huge risk to take for someone to eat and drink. And in that situation, uh, the communication I have is this might not be for the whole of your life. It might be for a couple of months that we need to stick to this plan as such. Mm. And, uh, and so get them on board with it. I, I agree with Jim's uh, suggestion that so often we have these wonderful discussions with the family, mm. but doesn't get communicated to the nursing staff. When mm. they go into, it's not just about speech therapy, it's about advanced care planning. Mm. And we spend hours of making decisions we should not resuscitate if, if something happens, but doesn't get communicated to the mm. nursing home staff who are the poor people who it might be. And they, if I was the nursing home, nurse who would manage that, I would have no option but to call up an ambulance crew to call up. I think the in geriatric medicine, what I find is more than anything else, the communication is the most important thing. And, and as mm. a group, we, we, we lack that at this moment of time. We can improve on it. And, mm. and, and, the, and the, maybe the system is not refined properly to have that. Mm. Yeah, that's what I feel. And, uh, the, the the speech and the swallow, and I also don't know the other thing whether you have discussed with us so far, how many speech pathologies we have in the community mm. to do all that, to cover all our nursing homes as such. Mm. So particularly in the rural areas, you know, it can be difficult to come across. Is that your experience? Exactly, that, yeah. Now, mm. if, if somebody asks me, I, I'll have, I'll have uh, 100,000 to spend on my unit let's not go to the community as such, in Toowoomba, by the main base hospital, mm. I would spend on two more speech pathologists. Mm. The, the priority, priority at this moment of time is for, because of the dysphagia, they, get, they don't get much time to, to deal with this, the, the speech aspect of it as well. Mm. And in the nursing homes, I, I visit a couple of nursing homes in and most of the places, uh, it's very difficult to find a speech pathologist because mm. there either there's no funding or whether there's no, uh, maybe there aren't enough of speech pathologists in our area. Mm. Mm. If I can change tone a little bit, um, we talked about sort of doing a clinical assessment for the patient's mm -hmm. dysphagia. Um, what about imaging? Uh, do we do barium swallows much these days? Is that the 
yes. method of choice? Yes, we still do uh, barium swallows or a modified barium swallow is, is mm. uh, what the speech pathologists will do. And that simply means that we will not only put fluid, uh, barium fluid, give barium fluid to the patient, we'll also give them barium coated food. Um, Giving, doing a regular barium swallow, yes, you see the function of the swallow and you see um, whether any aspiration is occurring, but you don't get much of an idea of how a bolus of, uh, of food will progress through, um, through the pharynx and through into the esophagus. Uh, so we also try several different textures of food in a modified barium swallow, uh, which is lots of fun for the patient. Uh, <laughs> Does it taste all right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can promise that one it doesn't taste nice. Um, but uh, most of the time our patients are very good sports about it all. Mm. Uh, but there is also a video, uh, I'm having an endoscope, that you can do with your ENT uh, and to have a look down at the top of the pharynx and see how the swallow is occurring there. So you can also do that, um, that sort of imaging. Uh, mm. We don't do that one quite so much because you do need access to an ENT to uh, perform that process, whereas it's much easier to access a radiographer at an X-ray department mm. uh, to perform a modified barium swallow. And mm. does that um, involve an anaesthetic with the e ENT? No, I believe they might do a spray, an oh, anaesthetic okay. spray. Some local spray. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but otherwise it's a nasendoscopy, mm. so there's very little discomfort uh, for that process. Mm. Great. Um, and the other thing I was going to ask about, you know, if, if the patients are sort of not keen to be using modified textures, um, you know, and perhaps maybe not so relevant in a 90-something year old, but um, perhaps in a younger patient, maybe post-stroke, um, would you look at um, surgical options like um, bypassing the swallow entirely like a, um, a peg or, or something to that yeah. effect? So the peg... The it sounds very simple when mm. you think about it yeah. and you bypass the swallow and you get a mm. tube in and that is a procedure that I, we don't rule out but have to be thought very carefully before you actually proceed to, proceed to a peg. Because talking about peg, the perception, usual perception amongst the, the general public and to that extent some of the healthcare uh, healthcare workers as well is because we are bypassing the throat that the risk of aspiration is is minimal mm. and in fact it's not the case and the studies have shown it's got this kind of the same risk as you having a tube mm. or, uh, a naso, uh, the nasogastric, uh, nasogastric tube mm. the there are a few things uh, we tend to discuss with a patient before we proceed to a uh, peg tube. Mm. The first thing is the misconception of lack of aspiration mm. and uh, the, the simple reason is especially with the stroke patients sometimes the gastric motility is also reduced and therefore there's a regurgitation always that can go into the lungs. Mm. The second, uh, second issue associated with that is the risk of the procedure itself. Although it sounds a simple procedure, I've seen patients having had a perforated uh, viscous as a result of that, the gastric, and, and I had seen three, two died within 24 mm. hours. Mm. It's, it's a very rare occurrence, but it can still happen. Mm. Then superbugs like MRSA and, the, and these, these infections can set in in that place and that can take a longer time to mm. recover as such. So the relatives and the patients need to discuss regarding all these options as well. Mm. And uh, the and also, I, the, one of the issues we have is that we, at this moment of time, the nursing homes do not have the capacity to manage nasogastric tubes. So if mm. a person is to be discharged from hospital to a nursing home, uh, we have to proceed with a, with a PEG tube unless they have made recovery. So rule of thumb mm. for stroke patients is that we, we give them three weeks. And if during that three weeks, if someone has, some, someone is improving on their swallow, we would give them further one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. But by the third week, there's no improvement at all. Then is the time, probably the time that we think of a tube. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have had many patients who have had big tubes, 
gone into nursing homes, made an improvement, which had come and got the tube removed as well. So having a PEG tube does not mean that for the rest of their lives, you might have that experience as well, mm -hmm. could, could probably take that tube out. But again, the practice is that even if you are completely independent with your swallow, you leave the tube in for another 30 days mm. because you do not want to take the tube out and then the next day find out the patient can, can't still swallow. <laughs> yeah, so you need to have that good period of time. Mm. So in a nutshell, if someone was going to have a PEG tube, again, a communication is very important, mm. explaining to them the pros and cons associated with it. And usually patients like it because of the irritation that you have having a foreign tube through the nose. Mm. And we find that once the tube is taken out and somehow their swallow is also a bit, improves a bit because of the irritation and there's lots of secretions generated mm. through that tube is also being reduced. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. So, the, so the PEC tube is certainly, we advocate that, but mm. it's not for everyone. Mm. Yeah. And so um, the nasogastric tube, um, you were mentioning that the nurses sort of in the nursing home are often unable to sort of provide the cares for that. So is that seen as a more higher acuity sort of level in a patient when they have to have something like an yes. gastric tube? The reason being mm. that if, you, if that is misplaced, mm. then these patients need to come back to the hospital to get it placed, get a chest x-ray again and to go back. Yep. It's a lot of labour intensive process as well. Mm -hmm. And then most of the nursing home staffs are not trained properly to manage nasogastric tubes as That's such. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And even if you put a PEG tube, we do not tend to send, send someone home straight away. We get the next mm -hmm. of kin trained to manage that if that person is going home mm -hmm. and then ask the nursing staff whether they can manage it as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so unfortunately nasogastric tube is not an option these days mm -hmm. for anyone who's been moved to a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think we might open it to the studio audience or to check our online uh, audience. Um, any questions um, that anyone has out there? Any sort of burning questions on this case? No. And it looks like it's all quiet in the Twitterverse at the moment. Um, so I thought I might actually um, ask, I don't know if Joe, if you're able to sort of flick back to the medication slide at all, um, just um, to put you on the spot there, Nissa. Yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit earlier just about the medications and whether it would be possible to sort of deprescribe or, or rationalise. And, and she's not on a huge number of medications, mm. but I just wondered your, your thoughts there as well. Um, yeah, in this So this of... is a patient who's on this medication who will, who is having he was having dysphagia yes. and so on a tube. Uh, yes, not, not, uh, not, not on a tube, but um, just no taking tube. thickened. All right, fluids. thickened, yeah. yeah. So one of the main things I can see that on this, the first one I'm seeing here is, uh, all right, the clopidogrel, mm. asacentine is actually dipyridimol and aspirin. Mm. And, uh, and it comes in a capsule. Okay. Yeah, so the, see the, the main, main, main uh, issue I see that is how this patient is swallow a capsule as such. Mm. So I would probably change this patient first to a dipyridomol and aspirin. Research evidence suggests that mm. a tablet of clopidogrel alone, a small tablet of clopidogrel alone is, gives a equal e efficacy as giving asacentin twice a day of a capsule. Mm. So you change two capsules to one small tablet. Mm. And, and probably clopidogrel can be, I'm not sure whether we got a pharmacist here, mm. and uh, the, uh, can be probably crushed as well, and crushed. oils mixed. Mm. And then I also see isosorbide mononitrate slow release, mm. 60 milligrams one. Now slow <coughs> release tablets again cannot be crushed because then the then we need to think of whether there is anything else that disintegrating uh, sublingual isosorbide mononitrate is a possibility that we can use. Then metoprolol 25 milligrams twice a day. Again, uh, someone 
who is having swallowing difficulties, rather than giving tablets twice a day, we could certainly think of if this was specially given for heart failure or something like that, then can be easily be converted into a bisoprolol equivalent tablet of bisoprolol, which is again a beta blocker, which can be given just once a day. Mm. And then veripamil 120 milligrams, again, that's a slow release tablet. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of tablets here, slow release, which cannot be crushed. Mm -hmm. So these can be maybe veripamil, there are some versions that can be given as liquid forms. Mm -hmm. So looking at this, I can probably, I will be thinking, I'll be changing four of these five medications. And, and it's all about, at this point of time, person going into a nursing home, trying to micromanage the medications to, to give them another six months of a, of a prolonged life expectancy is not, is not the right thing for that patient. I would rather give that person a one year of good quality of life rather than trying to micromanage their, uh, their problems and hopefully it's not worth to give that person a three years of a very poor quality of life rather mm -hmm. than achieving a one year of good quality. Mm -hmm. Again, isosorbite, you can easily do that with a patch. And, and mm -hmm. that patch can be changed from one to another. And uh, so this medication list can be easily optimized. Mm -hmm. And I, have the, I had the experience of visiting some of the nursing homes which I have audited. And out of the 60 patients I've seen, 45 patients, I actually reduced the amount of medication. Mm. Uh, the, another 12, I made it unchanged. And only eight patients, I actually had to start on a new drug. Mm. And the problem is that these patients were started on medications maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yes. And they get, get older their BMI comes down, but unfortunately nobody has looked at that drug chart mm. and, and reduced it. And it's partly, as the specialist, is our fault as well. We do not emphasize that much. And then would have gone through have several GPs. So the one GP, general practitioner, if I was a general practitioner, I would not want, not want to change something that another person had done. Mm. So looking at that drug chart, it's a fine example of how things can be changed in this case, and I'm glad that this came up. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, anything that any of our panelists wanted to add as we finish up the case? No. Yeah. So take home messages from what we've discussed would be good communication. Good communication. I think nursing homes, I think we, we, it's easy to put the blame on the nursing home staff. Mm. I had the same perception when I first started as a specialist. But more I went to nursing homes and visit them, I can see the job they are doing. It's not an easy job to be a nursing home a manager or a nurse there. Mm. They, they are understaffed and, and you've got different families with different expectations. Mm. And unless you are well communicated, they would always take the, the much more um, safe option mm. that would be calling up an ambulance to get these patients home. To the nursing home but in the middle of that is that patient who is going to suffer i think with the communication you can iron out most of the decisions that we make in the best interest of the patient yeah mm. any other take-home points i think de-prescribing and quality of life as a focus i think came yes. up a lot mm. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I just ask with, uh, there's a lot of telehealth and a mm. scarcity of uh, speech pathologists and things like that. Do, do, are you available to rural areas through telehealth? Uh, uh, is there a billing procedure for that through the Medicare uh, item numbers and um, care plans, things like that? Yeah, the, the Medicare rebates that we receive, <coughs> I believe it does need to be a face-to-face uh, consultation. In terms of dysphagia, it does need to be a face-to-face -face consultation. If it's a communication mm. session, then that's much easier to do as a telehealth session. Uh, but um, unfortunately, like it's been outlined, uh, it is a bit difficult to get us out there for communication and sometimes for dysphagia as well. Great. I think we need to wrap up this case but it's been a fascinating discussion and I think we'd all like to thank our panellists once again.